You probably hear a lot about emergence and self-organization, and maybe these words sometimes even sound a little bit too mysterious to you, but I promise you, this is actually a lot more concrete and less mysterious than it sounds. So in this video, we are going to look into the Agile principle number 11 and explore emergence, self-organization, and the context of teams. So if you're curious, let's get started. The Agile principle number 11 is the one that says the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. As you can imagine, we can go in way too many directions here. So the Agile principle number 11, the way I like to bring the conversation about is that it challenges three important assumptions. The first one being that specialization and especially over specialization will breed the best work. That is not true. The Agile principle 11 comes to challenge that. The second thing that it challenges, the second assumption that it challenges is that imagine that someone always must control decide and define and others must execute. And the third assumption that this principle challenges is that, you know what, once it's done, it's done. No longer touched, it remained fixed forever. So let's take a look into each of these. Taking a look at this first one, that specialization cannot guarantee better work necessarily. So there are two things that we mean by that. The first is definitely not a word against specialization. A lot of things that we know today, they require rather specialized knowledge. So you being a specialist in what you do, I am a specialist in what I do. And this is, this is great, this is fantastic, and we can get very deep in our knowledge about something. Yet, alone and isolated in our specialization, we can't solve for things. So let's say you are great in database and I am great in, in Java. I'm a great programmer, you are a great DBA. If we don't talk, we might be attacking a problem from completely different angles that cannot converge. And in the end, both you and I are supposed to provide a solution for a customer. So we have to combine our forces. Our specialization is great and it's a superpower, but that superpower can only be activated once we bring it all together. So that's a key piece. We have to collaborate. Now, Collaboration is not about working all the time together, but it definitely is about aligning the pieces of our work so that even we have enough time that is independent and productive that we can be on our corner, but that in the end, the overall solution makes sense and, uh, and we, we are, we're building on top of each other instead of clashing and conflicting. So the other side of it, which is kind of like really linked is that it's no longer just a, a desirable trait, but it's a necessity. It's an important skill to have is the ability to communicate and to work together, mostly because a lot of the problems that we will face today, they are very complex. They require multiple perspectives. So it's very likely that you will have one piece of the puzzle and I will have another. And alone, we actually won't be able to solve the problem by ourselves. Be that a product that we are creating, a, you know, an incident in production, anything really. And that even then makes the case and makes us think about like what happened we start you know, if we really rely on one single point of failure, one single person that can alone do something, it definitely is a principle that makes you question the resiliency of your team and their ability to deliver solutions. So as you can see, teams are formed and the whole point that of their strength is that they will own and support the solution together, which kind of then brings us to the second point of you know the second assumption that we are challenging with the agile principle number 11. And the second point then is that it's all about empowering the teams and not about someone controlling versus someone executing. That means that we are past the approach where we are handing off work as if there was a specific breaking point and for example, I stop and I do my analysis and then you take it and you do your development and eventually you stop and you hand that over. So these might be necessary steps 
in, in our thinking process for delivering a product. But that doesn't mean that there is a person that is only allowed to think and create a specification and people who are only allowed to do the coding. Because in fact, the, the skills that you have, the skills that I have, they are needed throughout the whole production of whatever it is that we deliver. So there is an implication here that great work will come from a certain level of autonomy and understanding of the problem. Just think about it. If you are the sole person responsible for the outcome of something and you're going to be praised or the opposite by the results, what do you think is going to happen? you yourself will try to control the outcome, right? And then you're going to tell people, do it exactly this way, the way I said, of course, because it's you who, who are facing the challenges of, uh, you know, of the outcome. But when it is the team, can you imagine the accountability of 10 people versus one? So not only I now am more invested as a team member who owns the solution of the problem, I also, and let's be real here, that happens. I cannot hide under the perspective of, well, it's not my fault. I did what you told me to do because actually I had agency, I had some decision-making power into the whole thing. So I can't hide behind this kind of excuse. So it's a very important aspect of self-organization in here, which is we really need to own things together to really put our creativity and our capability to the max. And something really interesting that I have observed now that, you know, product and customer centricity is all that we talk about when we mean business agility is this idea of design thinking and you have the double diamond and you have the discovery and the delivery phase. And I think this is a, you know, a fantastic idea for how things can operate, but I challenge you to really look deeper and see if that is not yet again in your organization and your teams, another excuse to create a silo and really separate those who think and conceptualize from those who actually execute and have to support the product. It can be a very uh, misleading approach and it can be done wrong and not really yield successful results to how you organize your team and your business. So if you're interested, just take a look at the blog post in which I uh, talk about it a little bit more. The link is in the description down below. The third assumption that uh, surprisingly still today, this principle comes in challenge is that the development of a product ideally software, but not only a product development, it's not a once and done thing for the most part. It is an element that the architecture and the design of a product will evolve over time. And while it's possible that if you have, let's say, a physical product, once it's out of the door, I mean, that product, that batch is done, right? You can't really modify it. Up until the point that the product, it's not the hands of the customer, you can still uh, provide modifications and adaptations, and that is a good thing. Given the feedback that you receive, maybe the next batch that you're going to do of your product is going to be slightly different, etc., cetera, and etc. Cetera. And in particular, if this is software, at any given point in time, you, you may find an issue. At any given point in time, you used to have a thousand users. Now you are so successful, and you have a million, and you have to go back and change a lot in the infrastructure. So. That is a more technical piece, but it still comes from the same place that a software that cannot change its architecture and its design in its own product on a daily basis, it's not able to be a valuable software because the reality is that software is malleable or it should be. That's why, you know, you have software and hardware, soft versus uh, hard and in the case of software, you really will gain from having that ability, that resiliency of constantly adapting your product. So the architecture constantly need to be changed. The UI of your product will probably suffer alterations. So if it's always in the hands of completely separate specialists, can you imagine how painful that is if we are not constantly collaborating? So you can see how it all ties into the other agile principles when you see if you want to constantly and frequently deliver value, you need to be able to provide adaptations. If you want uh, you know, to, 
to enable, to accept change, even late in the development process, you need to have that flexibility built in. And it's going to be a flexibility in your process of developing your product, but also in the infrastructure, in the technology, in the code, if that is software. So a product that is able to, to, to take in change easily is a product that is much easier to maintain. It's a product that very likely has a ton more of quality that is robust and is definitely something that shows that the team has excellent technical skills. So if we are to sum up really what this principle is bringing about is that the, you know, Agile is about empowering teams to make decisions about their work and encouraging collective accountability and responsibility in a project or in a product. So as a manager or a team coach or an agile coach, you will definitely be supporting your teams and asking the questions that really make people think about how are we setting us up for success when the product evolves? How are we guaranteeing some level of flexibility in evolution and adaptation in how we make our product and inside our product. We are asking what is it that stands in, a, in the way of us making the proper decisions because we are the ones really developing the product. So there's a lot of things that we know firsthand and we can provide a better solution for other than people that are, let's say, two or three levels of hierarchy removed either up or laterally. And we can continue asking, you know, like, are we really not autonomous? Why do we think we are not autonomous? Or what is the limit? What are the bounds of our autonomy? And all those sorts of questions that really encourage people to uh, push their level of responsibility and ownership responsibly. And it definitely involves a conversation with the teams and their managers and their stakeholders and sponsors, because in the end, you can't remove all these people as important pieces of the puzzle. They have have to work together and keep pushing with better questions. How do we define um, self-organization? What does emergence look like for us? Is there a, a place, a moment where nothing really emerges and it's more fixed? Are there places where there's a lot of flexibility, adaptation, a lot of emergence happening? Uh, what do we do about that? So really making people think about what does it all mean to us? It's a great exercise that you can do with your teams. And like I said, once again, with their managers as well and the stakeholders, really keep expanding those sorts of activities to make it very meaningful and impact how people do their work and how they think about doing their work. So that's it, my friend. That's the discussion about the Agile principle number 11, the one about emergence, self-organization. How do you see that happening for your teams or in your organization? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear. And stay tuned for the final chapter coming then, the Agile Principle 12, the one that's going to close it all in a nice loop for us. As for now, this video ends here. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was useful. I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.